Welcome to you all, everyone, colleagues, friends, students, and community members to this Neil A. Maxwell Institute Symposium keynote address by Professor Carolyn Osek. My name is Dr. Katherine Gines Taylor, and I am the Nibley Postdoctoral Fellow at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. My deep gratitude is extended to Dr. Mark Ellison, Associate Professor of Ancient Scripture, for co-convening this important event with me. And to our co-sponsors for believing in the project. We recognize and thank the Maxwell Institute, the Ancient Near Eastern Studies Program, Global Women's Studies, the Kennedy Center for International Studies, the Religious Studies Center, <laughs> Religious Education, and the Department of Comparative Arts and Letters all here at Brigham Young University. They've given generous support, and I want to also highlight and particularly thank Director Spencer Fluman, as well as Professor Eric Huntsman. For their early log logistical guidance and their advocacy for women as thinkers, as scholars, and as disciples. There are a myriad of tasks required behind the scenes to pull off a conference like this, and so much attention has been given to its success by our amazing Maxwell Institute staff, including Sandra Shirtliff, Blair Hodges, Soraya and Lilia in the back, and to my research assistants as well. Thank you all. I would like to take a moment on this International Women's Day to also take note of the namesake for this very auditorium, Alice Louise Reynolds, who was the second woman to be named a full professor in the state of Utah and the first female full professor at BYU. Her advocacy helped to establish this very library here at BYU. She was a true pioneer. As a matter of business, I want to remind you all of an, um, another upcoming event. On March 29th, the Maxwell Institute is also convening a one-day symposium on agency entitled Beyond Choice, Agency in Interdisciplinary Perspective. The keynote address will be given by Dr. Mark Rathall, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford. It will take place in the Education in Zion Theater, and a full schedule will soon be available on the Maxwell Institute website. Before I introduce our speaker tonight in a more formal way, we invite you to join with us in prayer, and our prayer will be given tonight by Mackenzie Johns, a do I see you, Mackenzie? There you are, Mackenzie Johns. Uh, a senior at BYU and an art history major and one of my research assistants. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this evening and um, this event and for this opportunity, opportunity that we have to come together and to better um, understand women who have gone before us um, and women in religion. We're so thankful um, for all of the women who have um, gone before us and we pray that we'll be able to um, learn from them and going forward we'll be able to also learn from uh, the women around us. We're so thankful for this gospel and for the power that um, we have as women. Um, and men in the gospel, and we're so thankful for um, Jesus Christ, and we're so thankful um, that we are able to learn through the Spirit, and please help us to um, learn through that Spirit tonight together as well, um, and we say all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This symposium and this address tonight are the result of a long-held and enduring desire to highlight the contributions 
of visual culture and women's religious experience in antiquity. Retrieving the many facets of women's religious lives often overlooked in the literary record is a daunting task. As an art historian, I know this well. The synthesis of objects, iconographies, culture and religious contexts, as well as literary sources, requires careful scholarship. It can yield surprising results and nuanced elements otherwise lost. The world of lay piety and religious reception is often revealed in quite humble ways. Even quotidian domestic objects can hold valuable information that illuminate devotion and practice outside of more official environments. Professor Osek's work had an early impact on me and my studies of early Christian women, art, and material culture. As I was preparing for this conference, I actually pulled out my copy of A Woman's Place from my bookshelf, and I was delighted to find the sticky notes that I had placed there over 10 years ago, we won't talk about it, were still in place. In 2007, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> As a mother to three small children, the youngest, my son, being just a year old, I started a PhD program at the University of Manchester in the UK. I remember reading this book early on in my doctoral studies. And in this very book, finding some very deep resonances with Professor Osek's work. She talked about the influence of women as managers of households, women of deep devotion who participated in house churches, and women who in many ways legitimized the early church with their patronage and their status. This book in part broke me open. It spoke to the many labors and relationships in my own life. And I gleaned from it a kind of kinship with these women whose absence is so much, in so much of official Christendom, became a presence in my own work and in my life. Thank you for your work and your legacy. Professor Osek's vocation and career have included many opportunities and activities. By way of introduction, allow me to name just a few. Professor Osek took her THD from Harvard Divinity. She spent 26 years teaching at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, followed by six years at Bright Divinity. She is now retired, but continues to work as the provincial archivist for the Society of the Sacred Heart her order in St. Louis. Professor Osek was the past president of the Catholic Biblical Association in 1995 and the president of the Society of Biblical Literature in 2005. Her publications, though not an exhaustive list, include Rich and Poor in the Shepherd of Hermas, A Woman's Place, House Churches in Earliest Christianity, Families in the New Testament World, Households and House Churches, and early Christian families in context. Following Professor Osek's address, there will be a, a question and answer period. And as a reminder, please keep your questions concise and speak loudly. We'll try to have a microphone for you in, uh, in case we need that. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Carolyn Osek. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I'm going to need to lean forward. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to keep uh, leaning forward. And they tell me this will work now. Aha, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, we've already had a very rich day, most of us who are here with all kinds of um, presentations and very um, inspirational things to me. 
all of you who have been presenting today would be considered um, the next generation from me. And uh, I'm just very happy to see all of the wonderful talent that is there. This invitation, though, has given me the opportunity to pursue an idea that's been in the back of my mind for some years and that I never got the chance to pursue it. So I'm going to sort of run that first and see how it falls. My starting point is 1 Corinthians 7.14. I've always puzzled over that passage. For the unbelieving husband is made holy through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. I find this an astounding declaration. It occurs in the context of Paul's deliberations about preserving a mixed marriage between a believer and an unbeliever. He has asserted that he is a saying from the Lord, our earliest attestation of the synoptic prohibition of divorce that's attributed directly to Jesus. But he recognizes that what he's received by tradition did not envision such a union between a believer and an unbeliever. And he's been asked by the Corinthians what to do about it. He's certainly not in favor of dissolving the marriage if it can be saved, though if necessary, because of incompatibility of belief and practice, it can be brought to an end. But he cannot let this be the last word. He ends the subject by holding out the possibility of the wife, referenced first, saving her husband and vice versa. Paul concludes the passage in verse 16 with the hope that the believing partner, whether woman or man, but the case of the woman is addressed first, may be able to save her, um, her or his spouse probably not only eschatologically, but with a sense of ongoing spiritual welfare. It's interesting that later the author of 1 Peter partially picks up the same idea, but this time it's only the wife who may save the husband, and it's through her submissive behavior. Paul's statement in verse 14 is at the center of this inclusionary structure that runs from verses 12 to 16, taking up the question of a mixed marriage that may or may not be preserved. Suddenly, Paul is talking in a very different way, though, here, about holiness. What is he talking about? Hey, yes, die. It's a perfect passive. She or he has been made holy. If we take the verb tenses seriously, it's about an action that has happened but continues into the present. Paul seems to be saying that the presence of the baptized believer gives the marriage a quality that it would not otherwise have. He doesn't yet have a successor to write Ephesians 5, comparing the husband and wife to Christ in the church. Just four chapters from here, though, in 1 Corinthians 11, he will argue that the husband is the head of the wife, as God is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of the man, but he does not include in this set of analogies that Christ is the head of the church. That idea has to wait for Colossians and Ephesians. We're not dealing here with ecclesial typology, but with actual marriage practice. Moreover, the presence of just one believer in the family has the same effect on the children. They too are made holy. And I don't think he's talking about infant baptism. I think he's talking about a state of being or identity. The awareness of that identity on the part of at least one parent passes on that identity to the children. The children, too, participate in this identity of holiness. To pursue in depth the idea of holiness that Paul brings to this conversation could take us far afield. We can't go there. That's for another time. But we can catch a glimpse by taking a look at two older translations. The King James, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they're holy. Or the old RSV, for the unbelieving husband is consecrated through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is consecrated through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it are, they are holy. I think these older translations get the point. 
The semantic field of hagios, holy, certainly did not principally have to do with virtuous behavior, as it more often does today. Any close reading of 1 Corinthians indicates that Paul didn't think there was much virtue in the Corinthian community. Rather, Paul would start from the other end. Because you are holy, shape up. So we're back to the question, what does he mean when he declares his people holy? In Paul's experience, the primary context of this Hebrew semantic domain of, of kadosh is cultic. So something or someone is holy because they pertain to the sanctuary or they're prepared for its use. For example, the priest and his clothing, animals for sacrifice, the temple itself, the silver, gold, and bronze spoils of war that will be dedicated to God. The identification of the holy extends, of course, to the Sabbath. By widening extension in the prophetic tradition from temple to the city Jerusalem, and then to the whole holy land, the land of Israel. The people of Israel is declared a priestly people and a holy nation, therefore belonging not to themselves, but set apart for God's use. This idea of the holy nation is picked up by the author of 1 Peter and used as a motive for living an honorable life. Paul knows and lives his Bible. He knows that the basic meaning of kadosh does not describe the moral state of a person. Its basic meaning suggests that someone or something is withheld from ordinary use and therefore must be treated with special care because it belongs to God. Moses must stop approaching and remove his, his shoes before the burning bush because he stands on holy ground. The holiness of God can be deadly to the unaware, as it was to Uzzah, who reached out to steady the ark in 2 Samuel. Because the prophet is dedicated in a unique way to the work of God, Jeremiah has this holy identity from the womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. In adaptation of this identification of the people with the holy, Paul can call his congregations the holy ones, hoihagioi, over and over again, both those to whom he writes and those who are with him and send greetings. It's in Romans three times, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians. He compares the community to the temple of God, which is holy. He inveighs against Corinthian engagement in lawsuits since the holy ones, and that's you, he says, will judge the world in eschatological scenario. Closest to the original sense of cultic consecration, he urges the Roman congregation to be present to present their bodies as a holy and living sacrifice pleasing to God in Romans 12. The trouble is, the people of Paul's, Paul's community are not set aside. These people to whom Paul writes are not in monasteries or ascetic communities. They live daily lives with family and work concerns. They marry, raise children, and try to make a living. They have dinner parties. They accept invitations to dinner elsewhere, and they take lawsuits to court. Years ago, when Margaret MacDonald and I were planning our co-authored book, A Woman's Place, I still remember Margaret's image of people coming into a house for the weekly meeting of the community and tripping over the children's toys in the peristyle. Or of participants in the Lord's Supper uh, in one part of the house being distracted by the cries of a woman giving birth in the back room. These kinds of images may be startling, but I think they're close to home. Real life was going on in these houses, the lives of families. Much ink has been spilled in recent years by New Testament scholars trying to locate these people on the grid of what we know of life in Mediterranean cities in the first and second centuries. For sure, they're not elites, but they're not the dregs of society either. If we look to ordinary life in places where we do have some access to it, notably Pompeii and Herculaneum, we see modest houses, businesses, public services, and how the residents participated in the life of their city. This is a kinship-based society, so most people are organized into some kind of kinship structure, whether by blood, marriage, or informal relationship. Sometimes whole households worshipped in the same religious tradition, but this was by no means the norm. There were differences of belief 
and religious practice within marriages, families, and slaveholding patterns. 1 Corinthians 7, among other sources, give us, gives us evidence of that. In spite of popular philosophical ideals of the authoritative father who effectively rules over everyone in his household, and in spite of patterns of total host, household conversion in Acts, the house of Cornelius and the house of the jailer at Philippi, free women, as well as enslaved persons, male or female, could and did make their own choices about religious affiliation. So they are like everyone else, and yet there's supposed to be a difference. The difference is that idea of being set apart for God's use. Paul expresses this most clearly in Philippians 3.20, our polygyma, our citizenship, is in heaven, and it is from there that we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our poor bodies into something like his glorious body. As argued by the anonymous author of the epistle to Diognetus, Jesus' followers are just like anyone else, with no particular customs or language. They participate in everything as citizens, but as resident aliens, aware of belonging to another citizenship. The letter of Diognetus says that, Shepherd of Hermas, Parable 1, takes it further. Believers live in a foreign land, and they will be unable to return to their true home if they get too invested in this one. A glimpse into developing differences in Christian practice and hence difficulties of such mixed marriages is revealed more than a century later in Tertullian's appeal against a Christian widow remarrying. It's, the, it's his, uh, one of his treatises to his wife. And especially marrying a husband who does not share her faith. For example, if she's to keep a statio, an early morning fast and prayer, he will want her to come at daybreak with him to the baths. On a day of fast, he will hold a banquet. If she's called on for a duty of charity, he will have urgent family business that will require her presence. How will he take her offering hospitality to visiting church members, rising at night to pray, and even going out at night to attend nocturnal vigils and feasts? These are very concrete examples of, of what, happens, uh, what happened in a, a marriage that uh, had one believer and one not. For Paul, believing women as well as men not only are holy, but convey holiness into their families, to their spouses and children. It's not that you're holy if you act this way, but rather you're holy therefore act this way. And of course, Paul has some very definite ideas of what this way is, don't we all? which he spells out throughout the rest of 1 Corinthians with regard to compromised food, lawsuits, incest, marriage, correct participation in the Lord's Supper, and correct belief about resurrection. It's not that his people are holy because of what they do or how they behave. They are holy because God has offered them the gift of faith in Christ, and they have responded to that divine initiative more or less. Their presence in the everyday world is supposed to make a difference. Seen this way, problem people in the community obstruct the flow of holiness to their spouse, their children, and to their world. Is that why Paul is so upset at their behavior? Seen from this perspective, it explains why Evodia and Syntyche, the two women whose disagreement in Philippi seems to have sparked the appeal for unity and harmony in Paul's letter to that community, are of such great concern for Paul. This appeal to agreement between the two of them, or possibly they together have a disagreement with Paul that he once settled, but it's probably that they have a disagreement between the two of them, uh, it doesn't seem to be an afterword to his elaborate appeal, appeal for unity. It's not a petty quarrel, oh, by the way, would you all do something about that? But as I read it, it's the center of the disharmony in the community of Philippi, which means they must be important figures in the church who are obstructing the flow of holiness in the community by their lack of unity. How were they to navigate this identity and live normal lives? Gradually, over some years, more questions got raised about public conduct. 
Rather early and often, there are references in Christian and contemporary Jewish sources that exclude the practice of abortion and the abandonment of newborns. It's in the Didache and Barnabas, Justin, Diognetus, Tertullian, Minucius Felix, Philo, Josephus, and Pseudophilides. By the time of Tertullian, questions are raised about attendance at the theater and the games and military service. Not in the first place because of the incredible violence, which is what would bring us up short at the games, but because of the compromised religious loyalties necessitated by participation in public sacrifice to gods that would now be the participation that would now be idolatry for them. However, one denial does not a practice make. Why did Tertullian think it necessary to write a whole treatise arguing that Christian attendance about against Christian attendance at the games? Josephus had asserted in his account of Herod building Jerusalem into a Roman city, complete with theater and amphitheater, that that was not Jewish custom to participate in these kinds of entertainment. But he's speaking of home turf, Jerusalem, not of Jewish residents throughout the, the, the rest of the Mediterranean world. The games were the major sporting events of the Roman world. We can suppose just as many sports addicts then as there are now, from all faiths. It's very important to remember that the vast majority of believers in Jesus, and they began to increase exponentially by the end of the second century, continued to live rather normal lives, perhaps occasionally experiencing some difficulties with their unbelieving neighbors over their odd practices but the Jews had already experienced that for several centuries. The rare years of outright persecution of Christians passed quickly until 303 and were usually confined to certain regions, but they did leave scars in the collective memory, producing the stories that blossomed into the gripping and often highly legendary accounts in the martyrdom literature that followed. A word about prophecy. <clears throat> The function of Christian prophecy has to be considered. Accepted prophets were certainly revered as holy, and prophecy is one role never denied to women. Besides the Montanist women prophets, Maximilla and Priscilla, through whom Tertullian in his Montanist phase says that the gospel is preached, there are others like the revered but otherwise unknown Amia of Asia Minor, of beloved memory to Eusebius, he simply names her with no further need of, of uh, introduction. His readers know who she is. There are others, such as the prophet Nanus, who had visions of angels and heard heavenly voices, the visionary Perpetua in the story of her martyrdom, the visionary in Tertullian's community to whom many flocked after the liturgy to hear of her visions. These women were revered as holy perhaps precisely because they were exceptional. By the fourth century, a strong tradition is evolving in favor of the ascetic life and the ascription of holiness to those who embrace it. So the who, who is holy, the whole idea is, is moving toward those involved in the life of asceticism. There's ample evidence in the literature for the idealization of holiness in the developing practice of ascesis and celibacy. Names like Matrina, pa Macrina, Paula, Eustopia, Marcella, and the Melanias are well known for the portrayals of their ascetic lives. Whether they began as wives and mothers, then turned ascetic, like Paula, Marcella, or the Melanias, or lived a life as ascetics, like Eustopia, Macrina, or Demetrius. But here, but there's also an undercurrent in the same literature written by male family members that's not as well known, that admiringly ascribes holiness to some married women. Mothers like Macrina the Elder, the grandmother of the ascetic Macrina, her daughter-in-law Amelia, the wife of Basil the Elder and mother of the Cappadocian theologians. There are also the women of the family of Gregory Nazianzen, his mother Nona, who converted her husband from a, the Hupsisterian sect, and his sister Gorgonia. Gregory says of his mother Nona, my mother was a worthy companion for such a man 
and her qualities were as great as his. This is in the funeral oration of, of, his, of his father. He turns his, his attention to his mother. She came from a pious family, but was even more pious than they. Though in her body she was but a woman, in her spirit she was above all men. Her mouth knew nothing but the truth, and in her modesty she was silent about those deeds which, deeds which brought her glory. She was guided by the fear of God. For the most excellent of men and of women were so united that their marriage was a union of virtue rather than of bodies, but they had children. Since while they excelled all others, they could not excel each other because in virtue they were quite equally matched. But she who was given by God to my father became not only his assistant, but even his leader, drawing him on by her influence in deed and word to the highest excellence, judging it best in all other respects to be overruled by her husband according to the law of marriage, but not being ashamed in regard of piety, even to offer herself as his teacher. Admirable indeed was this conduct of hers. It was still more admirable that he should readily acquiesce to it. He goes on to say that she was drawn to prayer the first thing in the morning, to fasting and vigil, to all night singing of psalms. She was the patron of the orphan and the widow and lover of virginity, though faithful to the marriage bond herself. So also in the holy assemblies or places, her voice was never to be heard except in the necessary responses of the service. It was also surely a great thing that she reverenced the sanctuary by her silence. That theme of a silence of, of, the, um, of, of the matron is one that runs through all of this, um, this, this literature. It's a, it's a variance, it, it's part of the whole Pudikiti, I think. Gregory's sister, Gorgonia, with her husband Olypius, had two sons and three daughters. Gorgonia was said by her brother to surpass everyone in modesty, prudence, and wisdom, and to surpass even men in the chanting of psalms and knowledge of scripture. She blended the excellence of the married with that of the unmarried state, and proving that neither of them absolutely binds us to or separates us from God or the world, but that it is mind, nous, which nobly presides over marriage and virginity, and arranges and works upon them as the raw material of virtue under the master hand of reason. For though she had entered upon a union of flesh, she was not therefore separated from the spirit, nor because her husband was her head, did she ignore her first head, but performing those duties due to the world and nature, according to the law of flesh, or rather of him who gave these laws to the flesh, she consecrated herself entirely to God. It's an unusual word that he uses there, kathia ro'o. She lived her role in marriage with prudence and piety, no adornment, which is again, of course, typical, and charity to the needy. Gregory recounts two episodes in which she was injured or ill and was miraculously cured. He writes that she died with a psalm on her lips. She died young because her parents were still alive. Her parents and her husband were there present at the funeral while Gregory was preaching. I think I find these uh, very interesting because for this time and place when asceticism is, is gaining such popularity, there are these interesting portrayals of Christian marriage and a, a very clear understanding of the, of the holiness of the, the Christian matron and mother. We turn to archaeology. Archaeological evidence for some contemporary examples of women who are considered holy and fill uncertain roles in the church. In the fourth century Roman sarcophagi, there are many depictions of a female so-called orons. We've been spending some time with that today. Often rather holding a scroll in the gesture of speaking with the two figures extended and the mouth open. 
More recent assessment of these figures suggests that they're not personified virtues, as sometimes thought, but educated women depicted on their own burial property. I, I particularly like Crispina, who's at the top left there. Um, an elderly, elderly woman who's bent over and um, still is, is um, clutching her book. There are a number of known inscriptions of women given the title Presbytera. I give two of the most interesting here. They bear the title, the women bear the title. It's not at all clear what that means in their context. And the first is Flavia Vitalia. She is um, <coughs> from Salona near um, Croatia, uh, sorry, present Croatia. And um, the consular date is 425. And uh, under our Lord Theodosius, consul for the 11th time and Valentinian, most noble man of Caesar, I, Theodosius, bought, purchased, the, uh, the understood thing is the tomb, from the matrona Flavia Vitalia, the presbytera sancta, and then the price. Uh, she seems to be the agent for the church, uh, for the cemetery. Uh, she's the one who, who um, uh, conducts the purchases uh, of church property for tombs, for individual tombs. And she's a presbytera sancta matrona. The second is Leta. And Leta is from um, uh, Calabria, Tropea Calabria. This is a very large um, funerary um, monument. It's big. It's, it's the size of a, a sarcophagus, the top of a sarcophagus. Um, and sacred to her good memory, Leta the Presbytera lived 40 years, 8 months, and 9 days. Her husband made this tomb. She preceded him in peace on the day before the Ides of May. Now, a presbytera, of course, can be simply the wife of a presbyteros, or even an older woman. Context is crucial for interpretation of inscriptions like these, and there are others in which one of those options is the best, uh, an older woman or the wife of a presbyter. But in both these cases, they are married women, matrona, and this one obviously it names a husband, or it refers to a husband. It's the husband who's dedicating it, who doesn't give his own name. They're married women who hold the title of presbytera apart from their husbands. If the husband were the presbyter here, surely he would have given his name and his title. What their role is with this title is not at all clear, except that, as I said, Flavia Vitalia seems to be a sort of a real estate agent for the church the local church cemetery. Women like Gorgonia and Nona appear in the sources because of their contact with a great male figure. We lack accounts of their complete lives, such as we do have, uh, however hagiographical, of some elite ascetic women like Macrina, the Melanias, Marcella, and Paula. More often, the idea of holiness will now adhere to these consecrated, uh, these people consecrated by lifestyle. The probably ascetic Egeria, for example, the far-reaching pilgrim from the West, who traveled all over biblical lands in the late fourth century, records that at the sanctuary of Holy Thecla in Seleucia and Isauria, she encountered again the holy deaconess Marthana, who was superior of a group of virgins and uh, this is someone who, whom she had previously met in Jerusalem. So the name holy gets, or the title holy gets ascribed more often to ascetics. The lure of holy ground and the part played by women. The extended burial areas in central Italy that we now know as catacombs began as burials on private property above and below ground, but then extended far underground. By the late 4th century, most of the catacombs of Rome had at least one tomb of a martyr and a lively business in pilgrimage to the martyr's tomb. What better place to be buried than as close as possible to a holy tomb? 
These favored burial areas grew into what we know today with many miles of underground corridors and thousands of burials. It's striking that some of these burial areas retained the names of their original owners and patrons who were women, Priscilla, Domatilla, and Camadilla. This was an important aspect of women's patronage that enabled the faithful to access the holy in their confrontation with death. Now this is the fun part for me because I'm going to show you something I'll bet nobody in this room has ever seen unless you are a specialist on uh, the cities in, in uh, North Africa. The Roman catacombs have been extensively studied and we've talked about them today, etc. But there's another burial complex around a holy woman who's less known, Victoria Sanctimonialis of Duga in Africa Proconsularis, Tunisia. A Sanctimonialis by this time is the title of a, an ascetic woman, a celibate woman. At Duga, down the hill from the top of the city where the civic monuments are, and the hills covered with cemetery, there are the remains of a small funerary church dating probably from the late fourth or early fifth century. Many of its pieces stolen from elsewhere, especially from the theater and the temple of Saturn up above. There are sarcophagi lining both walls of the nave of this little church. On both sides of the presbyterium, there are steps leading down to an open space below the altar. There are the steps. Those steps go up to the presbyterium, but then around the side, on each, in each case, there are steps leading down to a, a crypt below. There are more burials located below, but one is uh, central. It is directly below the altar. And even below, there are sarcophagi everywhere. It's everybody wanted to be buried as close as possible to this central um, tomb. And on that tomb is the inscription, Victoriae Santimoniale in Pace. And that is all we know about this woman. She's an otherwise unknown ascetic woman who was so important to her community that being buried close to her was to be buried in especially holy ground. I've always dreamed of writing a novel about her. <laughs> Meanwhile, deaconesses were alive and functioning in the churches of the East especially, and, and especially in those of Asia Minor, with a ministry especially to and with women, not only preparation for and assistance of baptism, but visiting the sick, ongoing instruction, chaperoning, hosting at pilgrimage sites, and in many other ways. The fourth century apostolic constitutions contains an interesting Trinitarian illusion that commands honor to the deaconess as a type of the Holy Spirit. It's a completion of a Trinitarian typology that begins much earlier with Ignatius of Antioch. His analogy of the bishop as God the Father and the deacon as Christ, who carries out the will of God, that's why. And what do you do with the presbyters? There are presbyters. Um, they are the council of the apostles, which doesn't seem to fit. You know, you've got God and you've got Christ, but oh, the, in between we've got the apostles. This, I think, reveals where the real authority was in Ignatius' thinking. It's with the bishop and his assistants, the deacons, and the presbyters are kind of window dressing. The deaconess now is added to this, and she's to be honored as the Holy Spirit. But there's an angle. Just as the paraclete does nothing for self without, except to glorify the Son, so the deaconess does nothing without the deacon. In each case, um, it, it, yeah, the didascalia contained the analogy, but not the further comment. So in other words, the, the, the didascalia said, the bishop is to be honored as God, 
uh, the deacons as uh, Christ, uh, the presbyters as the, the apostles, the deaconess as the Holy Spirit, without any kind of comment. But in, in, um, in the apostolic constitutions, there's comment on each one. The, um, in the comment, the, the presbyters uh, as apostles are, are sent out to, because they're sent out to teach and baptize. And also it adds then, the widows and the orphans are the altar of sacrifice and the virgins are the altar of incense. So they try to get everybody in there. But the perennial thinking about linking of holiness for women with celibacy is not far behind. Appoint a female deacon who is trustworthy and pure, hagnain, for ministry to women. The bishop, the presbyter, and the deacon should be married only once. So the single marriage, which is, begins in the, with the pastoral epistles. <laughs> While the deaconess should be a pure virgin or a widow married only once, the univira ideal. Faithful and honorable. So the, the male clerics can be uh, married if the marriage, and it specifies the marriage has to be before, before ordination. The deaconess has to be either virgin or widow. In the prayers for the ordination of deacons, they are to be constant without blame, to be filled with spirit and power like Stephen. In the prayer for the deaconess, the ordination of the deaconess, as you filled with the spirit, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, and Huldah, and did not disdain to have your son born of a woman, who instituted women guardians of the gates of the temple, give her the Holy Spirit and cleanse her of all pollution of flesh and spirit. Where did that come from? So that she may worthily fulfill this ministry. Nothing like that in the ordination of the deacon. Lest we think, however, that this kind of thinking about women was a later development in Christianity, let's return to Paul and recall another line from 1 Corinthians 7, later in the chapter. Having earlier discussed the intricacies of married life among believers and non-believers, later in the chapter, he advocates no marriage at all in view of the eschatological situation in which he believes that they are. For that reason, the unmarried man can devote himself to the things of the Lord instead of to worldly things and how to please his wife. The unmarried woman and the virgin can devote herself not to worldly things and how to please her husband, but to pleasing the Lord, and so be holy in body and spirit. The focus on the chaste female body is not new with the later rise of Christian asceticism. To step back a bit, by tracing some developments and ways of thinking with regard to women's lives through the filter of perceptions of holiness, we can see some of the seemingly contradictory message, messages conveyed to women of the time and that have come down to us. Some previous paradigms have posited a breakthrough at the time of, Jesus, of the Jesus movement when full gender equality, at least for the freeborn, if not for slaves, was practiced, followed by a later time when this initial insight was lost and this equality degenerated. I don't find this kind of paradigm convincing. Uh, I would rather uh, turn to those scholars who would, would talk about two different streams of tradition running consecutive, consecutively, in tension with each other, an expectation of modesty, silence, and submission, and another of active engagement, not only in daily life, but in worship and political events. We have seen in some of these examples the attempt to combine both ideals and both realities. Women had to hold both these pressures in tension and navigate their way through, learning how to practice agency in effective ways. Sometimes previous scholarship has focused on the extraordinary. The women who resisted, broke the mold, and dared to be different. 
This way of thinking has come under criticism from post-colonial scholars as Western liberal ideology, in which the final goal of human well-being is freedom in and through action. How are we to interpret both the cultural strictures on women as modest, silent, and domestic, and at the same time, the clear evidence that some women exhibited behavior contrary to those social expectations that by any criterion would be considered agency and leadership. As I thought about this, I, I came up with five or six um, different um, lines of interpretation that have been offered, and so I summarized them here, and perhaps in discussion we can deal more with them. <coughs> One way has been to affirm the cultural expectation of quiet submission as the norm, and then to consider those women whose behavior is outside that norm as exceptional. A second way has been to assume that the image of submissiveness was a literary commonplace that received little attention in the real world. A third way has been to think of different expectations for different social groups, elite versus non-elite, Roman, Greek, Jew, etc., that the expectations were different. The fourth way has been, in the case of Christian women, to affirm a radical new liberation of women among the disciples of Jesus, following on the gospel record of his dealings with women. In this case, the church liberated women. Well, this is doubtful anyway. It's also problematic for another reason. The liberation, then, is usually from the supposed suppression of Judaism. Happily, some of our Jewish academic colleagues have long ago called out the bias on that idea. This liberation would then have lasted perhaps through the first generation, though this is difficult to reconcile with passages like 1 Corinthians 11 and 14. It would have lasted through the first generation before patriarchy again slammed down on its female victims to oppress them as much as ever in the pastoral epistles and then later figures like Tertullian. This morning, the, uh, uh, the passage of, from Tertullian about you are the devil's gateway was, was read, and uh, I have to say that uh, yeah, Tertullian, of course, had a wife. I, I've always tried to imagine her sitting there listening to this, you know, and saying, wait till I get him home. <laughs> Yet another way in which recent scholarship has approached the anomaly of known social restrictions on women at the same time significant social prominence of some women has been to posit celibacy as the liberating option for women in order to escape the strictures of subordination imposed on married women. While it's certainly true that even in the early imperial period, wives were never the social equals of their husbands, and moreover, that in the ancient state of health services, childbearing was always a life-threatening activity. Yet, as we have seen, there's sufficient evidence of married women exercising economic and social power within their own range of movement and being appreciated and loved for it, while Christian celibate women surely fell under patriarchal power in their own way. So, rather than either-or improvement or retrogression, Perhaps the best way to see the seeming contradiction, these seeming contradictions, is as a continual tension in the culture between the strong traditional ideal of the modest, silent, submissive woman and the complementary ideal of the strong woman who takes leadership in appropriate ways. A tension already present in ancient Mediterranean culture and continued in early Christianity. Any notion of linear development in either direction toward the liberation of women, which is a Western liberal bias anyway, or toward their containment and subordination, which is a traditional bias, does not seem warranted. Rather, the dynamics of both liberation and oppression and everything in between are to be seen at every level and in every historical period. These very terms, however, are troublesome. Living and acting within social expectations can be an exercise of agency. And I would love to be here March 29th when you talk about agency. 
Um, and it can be an exercise of agency as well as resistance to those expectations. There are many different ways to empower and to be empowered. So in conclusion, I hope that these reflections will serve as something of a summary of the issues that will encourage further examination and discussion as we continue our considerations of women's life and religious practice in antiquity. Thank you. So, that's just to have something besides words on the, on the screen. <laughs> um, so, there is some time for um, any questions, discussion, reprimands, um, <laughs> corrections, whatever. Yeah, very good association, um, and, and certainly that would be true. It would, it would be that um, that his experience doesn't contradict that tradition. You know, it, it enforces it. His experience is he was called. He's he's very clear about that. Yeah, and uh, he doesn't use the word holy of himself certainly, um, but uh, he is called to holiness to a particular kind of holiness by God, and. Um, and is given the charge to, to preach that. Yeah, thank you. Yes? Can you elaborate more on this transition from holiness being part of an exceptional experience of regular life to the transition to holiness being part of ascetic life? Mm. Mm -hmm. in that, I mean, for example, Perpetua is very different than some of the saints who come after her who are more ascetic. Yeah, yeah. Perpetua is not an ascetic at all. I mean, that, well, she's, she's really before that tradition is developed, right. you know. It's fourth century. Uh, I guess you get a little bit of it late third, but, um, but mostly it's, it's after the great persecution is over. And uh, some people have said, uh, uh, well, okay, we don't have martyrdom anymore. Now, now, what do we do? You know, to be holy, and and that and that that's a um, an impetus for the development of of asceticism, a Christian asceticism. And once you've got that, once you you have these heroic figures, um, it it tends to overshadow the the quieter holiness and and the holiness of married life. And you see that struggle in there. The way Gregory even talks about his mother and his sister. Yeah, they're not ascetics and not celibates, but they're holy. You know, it, he he struggles with it. Yeah. There was one over here. Yeah. I read a book called Portrait of a Princess. I mean, sorry, Portrait of a Priestess about women who were holy. Mm -hmm. And it's about the Well, they certainly are, um, I don't know the language that's used of them, I don't know if, if the Hagios language is used of them, but they are certainly set apart, consecrated, very, very definite sense of set apart for God's use. And in the case of the civils, of course, they're, they're, um, they're usually married, uh, I think. Anybody know anything different? Um, I think they are. It, and the priestess, I read that book a long time ago, is that uh, married, you said unmarried and married? Yes, um, before marriage, um, women would go and serve in the temple, leaving, mm -hmm. the, leaving the, um, the priest to serve the temple, and then they would go and serve in the temple, yeah. and had other sacred temple roles, including circles of dancing and prayer. Yeah, yeah, those are the unmarried ones now. Uh 
Uh -huh. But then once you were widowed or past the time of care for children, then you could go back, Come back again. into the temple. It's very similar to the, the deaconess idea, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that, I suppose, in the, the practical thing there is uh, the married woman is supposed to uh, put all of her attention into pleasing her husband. And Paul even says that, you know. Uh, and, and, and that's probably true with, with the, um, the Greek priestesses as well. But there is something else going on there. And it's the fear of female sexuality, I think. And blood. Blood has something to do with that, of course. Fear, the fear of uh, blood is taboo, it's sacred, it's holy, you know. You don't mess with it. So, but, but yeah, it's the same pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, there was somebody, with, yes. I'm not sure if it's, I hear uh, that I understand the question. Um, so martyrdom and asceticism are both very extreme forms of holiness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you're saying that a quieter, like lifelong holiness, is more apparent during the time of the extremism of martyrdom. Um, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, the, the, the lifelong holiness is the quieter thing that usually doesn't get the attention. Um, what, what I'm saying is that I think there were plenty of whole, very holy people who were living ordinary lives, you know, and we just don't know about them. And, except in the case of somebody like Gregory who's going to speak out about his mother and his, his uh, sister. And, yeah. yeah, what gets all attention is, is the extremes. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's primeval. It's primeval, you know. And and the uh, the blood rituals in Judaism are, are a reflection of that. And and Greece has its own, you know. It's it's just it's a very primal um, fear because the life is in the blood. When you shed blood, it's like you're dying. And yet women shed blood and they don't die. So how does that happen? It scares men. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it's it's awesome, you know. So you want to um, you want to surround it with care, care and rituals, and and you don't want that um, interfering with the sacredness of the temple. It'd be clash, <laughs> clash of holiness. Anything else? Okay, very good. Again, thank you all for coming. Um, one last request, if you have presented or will be presenting at this conference, we would like to gather for a group photo, so don't leave yet. Thank you all, and um, please be safe as you return home.